My original plan was to draw some conclusions from this and propose some goals that I thought art quilters could work toward in the future. And I've been working on this ever since I got the slides or the CD, and I hated it. I couldn't come up with anything definitive to say. <laughs> but I've got some observations. Because as somebody said to me this week, do you ever stop talking? <laughs> I never stop thinking. I think about this all the time. So I just want to share some of my observations with you. Here's the first one. Art movements have so infiltrated Western culture that we reference them without even knowing that we're doing it. So you have had a little bit of a preview of art history here, and then you look at these other pieces and maybe you can see the connections. But I think one thing that we as quilt makers, art quilt makers and artists need to do is to more fully embrace the history that has preceded us as a way of referencing where we are right now and where we're headed into the future. I find it shocking sometimes that I'm in classes with people who really have no idea of even the most basic uh, bits of art history. And I hope that we can encourage each other to visit museums and expand the repertoire of what we know about art and what we know about the world around us, whether it's um, a period that happened 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 500 years ago. I think it's important to be an educated person in this regard if you would like to be a really serious artist. The other thing that I, second point, this is a field made up predominantly of women, which is not going to be a surprise. All you have to do is flip on the lights and take a look around. <laughs> I think this is interesting because it's contrary to every art movement to date. Think about it. In this show, there was one man, and I didn't know it was a man, which shows you how names can be deceiving and how important it is to do your research and check in with the boss before you get up in front of people and start saying mm -hmm. things that aren't true. In the recent issue of the Surface Design Journal, which focused on art quilting, there were 24 women artists and four men. And one of the male artists represented wrote the most major article in the entire journal. It was a great article, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to be thinking of. Because I, what I wonder is, how does that affect competition? Is it true that women are not as interested in competition as men? I think most of the women sitting in this room are thinking, Jane, get a grip. We've all been members of quilt guilds. And quilt guilds can be the most competitive atmosphere. <laughs> worse than a spelling bee. <laughs> but I can't help but wonder, you know, with pricing, Two weeks ago, somebody sent me a link to a show at the Gagosian Gallery in New York City where there is right now, and you can look it up or you can go to my blog, existentialneighborhood.com, there's a mouthful, where I have a link to this show in New York City where these paintings are selling for thousands of dollars and they're discharged bed sheets done by a man born in 1968 in Poland. More power to it. I don't want to take anything away from him, but let's go girls, what's going on here, you know? Why isn't my work in that gallery? It's just something to consider. Why is that? Are we still dealing with gender bias? And if we are, what are we going to do about it? And we don't want to leave out, this is, it's an inclusive atmosphere here, what are we going to do about it together? Number three, art quilting is like a huge organized religion which is unlike any art movement today. <laughs> so, Studio Art Quilt Associates, an example of a group of women who have taken matters into their own hands and have been developing venues that are desired and needed in order to progress. I think this is good. This is powerful. There's a lot of money in that organization, and there's a lot of energy. And when they need $20,000 to mount a show, and they put a call out on the internet, they raise it. More power to them for that. They're creating venues for parallel play as they try to make this effort to go mainstream. And I think that part is really good. But I think it's also frustrating because the art world is territorial and we haven't really been able to move these things into the venue.
venues, we, we're not really in New York City in the same way that that, that guy from Poland is in New York City in a gallery. The question is, are we, are we aware of this and are we content to be where we are? Do we want to be in a textile ghetto? Do we want to have parallel play and keep everything we do over here? And if we don't, you know, maybe we do and maybe we don't, it's certainly not up to me to say. All I want to do is get the conversation going. But if we don't, how can we address these issues in order to expand the sphere of influence? With such force and numbers, I don't really understand why we're not taking the mainstream art world by storm when it seems to me that we probably could. So I wonder, maybe we don't really care, and maybe it's a societal, societal issue, and maybe 40 years isn't that long, and evolution is very long, and maybe it's still just a matter of time. But I do think that one thing we could do, or we could at least consider, is um, how we present the work. <clears throat> Should we be thinking of eliminating some of the visual clues that tell people or that reference people to, I made a joke about this, it's, it's absolutely true. I entered some pieces one time, the jurors said they looked like shower curtains and I didn't get in. Does the binding say something that we could, we could lose if we get rid of a binding? When do we decide we want to go that route and when do we want to stand our ground because we're quilt makers, damn it. Do we really want to hang on to that? And I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. But I do think that some of the resistance is semantic. That we could let go of some of the ways that we have shaped our work in order to, um, because of the, the greater good that would be happening if the work could go into venues and lose some of these the, the, the things that send mixed messages that we don't really need. We can let go of that. We can let go of that. And I do think that women are competitive, but that we're also in some way maybe too willing to be homogenized. <coughs> and that we need to go into our studios and be alone, that if we are going to interact with each other in guild settings or workshop settings, we want to be very clear about where our boundaries are. We want to be really clear about honoring it when somebody else figures out some cool thing to do instead of everybody jumping on the bandwagon and copying that. I think we can read magazines that suggest fantastic ways about how to use Lutridur and Citrusol and all of that, the quilting arts and cloth paper and scissors and all of the popular magazines. There are great ideas there. But I think you almost have to take the magazine into your studio and close the door and think, what am I going to do with this? Because otherwise, I think we run the risk of not being able to be identified as unique and distinct from each other. And each of us has that right, male and female. Each of us has that right. So it comes down to the choices that can be made if we want to orchestrate this as a dialogue. And I don't think any one person can dictate any of it. And that's the beauty of the fact that it is a democracy that we live in. And that is the beauty of being in a setting where if we are kind and open and we all agree that we, we all want the best for the situation, it's the sort of thing that we can sort out. So of everything I've said, I think it's interesting to note the classifications. And I think it's grist for the mill to point out the various observations that I've made. But I think what it really comes down to, the most significant thing I can share with you tonight, is that each of us must walk into our own studio, must become intimately aware of our own process and preferences. We each have to analyze information in order to determine what our sense of meaning and sensibility and meaningfulness <coughs> should be. We have to decide about our own creative growth, and then we have to have the courage to pursue it. And we have to support each other in that particular courageous act. And I think that's what Form Not Function honors. And I hope you will enjoy looking at the show from that vantage point.